Jamie did an amazing uh, introduction for me, so I don't really need to go any further except to go connect back to um, the concept of this word intention. And um, you'll hear me continue to come back to that over and over again, because it's such a foundation of not just how I coach and lead, but also how I attempt and endeavor to live my life every day about really connecting with who, who do I want to be? How do I want to show up? Um, and then how can we how to have awareness of our actions and to become more effective at showing up to have the impact that we want to want to have as well. I want to tell some stories today too, because I think stories are more important than just sharing concepts as well. And that's really the foundation um, of the book that I wrote with Mr. Yoshino, who is actually 77 years old uh, and worked for 40 years of his entire career until his retirement uh, at Toyota. At some really important inflection points in Toyota's history. He joined in the late 1960s as a new college graduate and spent his entire career there helping support many of the Toyota senior leaders as they were learning how to, uh, what it means to lead in the Toyota way. So what, uh, what we sort of take for granted as lean foundations and lean leadership really was an intentional um, effort by Toyota's senior leaders and leaders at all levels to continue to reinforce the way of thinking and the way of acting that we sort of um, just assume is sort of part of their culture. But it does require, as Mr. Yoshino often says, a retightening of the belt and intentional focus to make sure that practices continue. So we're gonna start off with a question for you and then dive into some more things. So open up the chat, please. and. Um, Put in for yourself, how engaged do you intend to be for the next uh, 45 minutes of us here together? This is a way of these like micro intention setting. And it's okay to be, it's important to be honest where you are, but then use this as an opportunity to maybe adjust what you need to do to show up in the way that you want to be um, here today. So if you can pop that into the chat, that would be, um, that would be great. And this, again, these concepts of in taking intention pauses to just really slow down and um, ground ourselves. We move so fast from meeting to meeting and you know, family to home, even in the same house, in the same room. I was just eating breakfast really quickly, having fed my kids partial food as well. And it's important to take these intention pauses for where we are in the moment so that we show up how we wanna be. Uh, so I'm gonna tell a few stories and actually I hear him walking down the hallway. Uh, here is my husband, John and Mr. Yoshino and me. And this was just over, can't believe it, six years ago in Japan. And I wanted to give you a little sort of context for how did this whole Japan connection come to be for me. A um, little back history, I, as Jamie said, I came from a background in health, healthcare. I actually started my career in academia doing health policy research moved to Australia, did my master's degree, and at that point decided to make a bit of a career shift. Um, I love learning and I love that aspect of research about kind of going deep into a, a topic and sharing learning. But for me, I didn't find that I was engaging with people enough. So I moved into um, consulting for several years and then moved back to the United States. And it was at that time that I took a job at a, uh, the Stanford University's Children's Hospital and that was my first exposure to lean thinking and practice. I was a performance or process improvement internal consultant. And what really got me excited was working with the people who do the work to help them solve the problems to deliver value and improve the experience for our patients, which, you know, it's, there's nothing more, uh, you can't be more behind a mission than a children's hospital of um, uh, saving lives. So that was very mi mission driven. And through my experience, I, I, I had some ahas, and this is part of what I, this is like the root of what I do today is helping people to reconnect with the things that maybe have served us for, and got us and given us success in independent, being independent contributors, um, being deep expert content experts in, um, in, in some body of knowledge does not serve us in the same way when we move into a people development role. So I was now a coach and a consultant to the organization, but when I came in and was the expert problem solver, I was great at solving problems and I engaged people, but we weren't really teaching them how to sustain and improve and, and continue to 
um, to grow and take in, and make sure that those improvements really stuck. So we needed to shift our role. And that, that requires us as individuals to shift how we're showing up. So I'm gonna, I'll dive into that more later. But then fast forward, I took some more senior roles at another healthcare organization and then started my own consulting practice. And less than a year before, uh, after starting my consulting practice, my husband sent me a message saying that he had an opportunity for his work for us to move to Tokyo uh, for 18 months. And I was both daunted and thrilled by the idea. I just had had our second child. So it was like, you know, he was three months old. Uh, but anyway, I was, I, I did, I was very excited by the opportunity, especially because of being able to dive deep into Japanese culture and the Toyota way. And I happened to meet Mr. Asao Yoshino at a conference in California six months before he moved to Japan. And so he gave me his card and said, when you move to Japan, look me up and I will take you to Toyota City, which is outside of the city of Nagoya, and we'll spend the day together. So here we are, this is April of 2015. I insisted that my husband take his, the day off of work because I really thought this was going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. I mean, here's this like senior Toyota leader. He was the, Mr. John Shook's boss. John Shook was the former president of the Lean Enterprise Institute and he uh, was the first non-Japanese employee of, uh, of Toyota Motor Corporation when they were looking to expand to uh, foreign production in the United States in the early 1980s. But so here we are outside of Nagoya Station and we just hit it off so well that day, had a great tour of, uh, of the, one of the Toyota factories. And we, then we went to Mr. Yoshino's university, um, his office in the university and talked and I met some of his students so they could practice English. And that was the beginning of um, what has now become our partnership, the book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. Even some of the quotes from the book are, are from that first meeting. And he granted me, I asked him, and he granted me permission to write about um, my reflections of our conversations. He said, anything I say to you, you can, you can write about. And I just started writing a blog because I wanted to share my experiences, not just for what I was learning for myself personally, but share them more broadly in the world. So, uh, so that was 2015. Then uh, fast forward, this is me in Japan last year in January, the very end of January, actually the cover that the next day we took the photo that's on the back of the book. This is us um, out to dinner across from the Nagoya Hilton. I thought I was going to see him like three or four more times last year, twice more in Japan, once in Europe and once in the United States. As we know, um, our plans for 2020 didn't come as we thought. And then here is us just last week talking. We talk almost every week and we've continued to partner and share and learn together. Um, and I'm really excited to share some of those stories with you here. And hopefully you'll have a chance to hear Mr. Yoshino talk as well. When I first started to uh, meet with Mr. Yoshino, I was really curious about what is so special about Toyota and you know, what we call lean, which has now moved into the agile world and, and so much like all the foundations of this thinking and process came from Toyota. And I was like, what, what's the secret? Why are they so successful in all this? And he'd say, there's no secret, there's no secret. And then one day early in our conversations, he said something like this, the only secret to Toyota is its attitude towards learning. And he said, we don't even notice and we take it for granted. And I think that's so true. Um, other researchers like Mike Rother and Jeff Liker and others have said when they've gone into Toyota to try and understand you know, what what the secret is and how they function, no one at Toyota can really explain what they do. There isn't actually a Toyota Kata. There isn't, there, they don't have these processes. It's just ingrained in the culture and the rituals that people are taught from the very beginning. And it's very intentional. And ultimately everything ties back towards an attitude towards learning and how we can learn. So all tools, all processes, all techniques, it's about how can we learn and improve not just a tool for a tool's sake um, or doing something just because um, someone else is doing it, but it's about learning. And so I think it's really important for us to remember when we're trying to develop learning in, what, in whatever format in the organizations and the people that we're supporting that we need both technical problem solving skills, technical tools, processes, capabilities, and we also need the social skills about how do we coach and develop people so that they're more effective at using the tools, at problem solving. And um, we often think of things as either or, 
So I want to talk more about that because this is the sort of the foundation of, of the talk here today is that we need to harness the power of the word and. We often think of it's either this or that, but how about if we bring things together and see the word and. So we think we either need to be telling or asking. We need to be an expert or we're a coach. We need to either challenge someone or we're supporting them or really focused on the business outcomes at the expense maybe of people development or people development at the expense of business outcomes. So how can we shift our mindset to doing these at the same time and learn to see these as continuums? And what we need to do for each of us is get more, uh, this is where the art of leadership comes in and the art of coaching is where do we need to be on this continuum in the moment to be the most effective, to help other people move forward and for us to move forward in problem solving as well. So there, it's not either or, it's and, and it's about navigating the continuum as it's most relevant and helpful in that moment. And we're gonna talk a bit more about that here. So Jamie already shared um, my, one of my favorite slides about the word intention. Here's my giant Daruma that <laughs> also has the word intention on it. I had this made in Takasaki a town um, outside of Tokyo where most of the, these paper mache darumas of all sizes <laughs> are made. And I had the word intention put on it for me because it's such a powerful, powerful world, word. And actually I have a slide later, but I'll tell you now. So if you, these dolls represent the um, Japanese saying, fall down seven times, get up eight. And they're weighted at the bottom. So I can't do it very well in my hand, but they will write themselves back up. And when you have a goal, you fill in one of the eyes. And then when you achieve your goal, um, you get to fill in the other eye. And it's really about, you know, I liken it back to this concept of perseverance and intention. You need to be, make visible your goals and your intentions and then persevere, keep getting back up, learn from your failures and mistakes and keep, keep moving forward. And then I, and that's why I love the, the Daruma dolls. So again, the symbol of heart and direction. So we often hear the word intention and it's more just like, what do you intend to do? But I see intention is more powerful when we say, what action are we actually going to take to fulfill that intention? So when we couple intention and action together, that's where the power comes in. And it's about really understanding what's, who do we want to be and how do we want to show up? And I see some differences between intentions and goals. Again, intention is really that connected with this heart internally inside of you. Who do you want to be? What's important to you? Your values? And then goals are what do you want to achieve more externally to yourself? And both are very important, but it's uh, sort of helpful to have that distinction for yourself as well. So in the spirit, and that was a lot of information, I'm going to dive into the book now, but into the spirit of this concept of Hansei, which is reflection. And we learn by processing and actually making our thinking visible. I'd like you to reflect for one moment and put in the chat what is one takeaway you've had from this section or this first part of our, um, our, dis our presentation here today? So feel free to put that in the chat. Thanks. Great, culture is doing, open-minded learning, fall down seven times, get up eight, aligning our heart with our goals, have an attitude towards learning. Great, keep putting that in. Um, it's great to have that connection. All right, so I'm gonna to transition to my experience more with Mr. Yoshino now and some stories from the book. And I mentioned earlier that the first time that I met Mr. Yoshino was actually uh, six months before we moved to Japan. And he and I, it was total serendipity I was, it was my first professional conference after having our second child and I was uh, teaching a workshop with my, my mentor and um, coaching partner, Mar Margie Hegany. And uh, Mr. Yoshino happened to be in LA and John Shook invited him to come speak with him on stage. And so they were talking about their experience of working together with Mr. Yoshino actually is um, the senior manager, two levels above John Shook and, and John about uh, their time together in Japan. And Mr. Y Yoshino totally destroyed any preconceived notion I had of about stoic Japanese senseis. He was up on stage, just very jovial and warm, which is genuine to who he is. And he, 
he was actually even joking about how he was he had forgotten underwear and so he was actually at the moment john ship called him on it um to invite him to come, to come to the conference he was driving around la looking for a walmart or something so i thought that was um it showed a lot of humility and just his, his real personality anyway he also said some very profound things and this one comment he made has really changed so much for me or not changed but it just his his um influenced me tremendously and is now what i consider sort of the foundational um, leadership principles. And he said, my aim was to develop John by giving him a mission or target and supporting him while he figured out how to reach that target, while he figured out how to reach the target. <clears throat> and as I was developing John, I was aware I was developing myself as well. And it's like, this is so you know profound and simple that the, the leader's role or the purpose is just is to set that direction. That is the leadership responsibility and provide support to help enable people to move towards that direction. And at the same time, you have to develop yourself. It's not about all these other people. Yes, you need to help them develop, but you also need to first start with yourself. And so I wanna to talk to you about each of these components and, and the stories within in the book actually show that it's written in the arc of Mr. Yoshino's entire career. So you get to see his own learning journey across these dimensions as well. So, uh, a leader's role is to provide a challenge, direction, or target. So this is, you know, one of the things, the, sorry, my chair is really squeaky. <laughs> one of the biggest challenges I see in problem solving, well, there are many, but that when I'm working with teams in particular, that when we're defining what a problem is, which is target minus actual is the gap or the problem we need to close, that uh, people often say, I don't know what actually should be happening. I don't know the target. I don't know the goal. And that's really up to um, the leadership team to help clarify and set that. Yes, other people who do the work can help identify and, and, and provide input into that. But ultimately, leadership need to say, what should be happening? Where do we need to go? And that then enables people to do problem solving and really define a problem. Mr. Yoshino always talks about how targets should be determined by what is needed, not by what is achievable. So what this means is, and what I've taken is, you know, what, what do our customers actually need? And that should be our, our ultimate challenge target. Maybe you have set interim targets along the way. But my experience, I have sat in too many meetings, and I'm, I'm sure you have too, where there is a discussion of, oh, what can we achieve? And we set targets that way. Or, oh, it's probably not possible for us to do X, Y, and Z. And so we let that influence the target setting or the goal setting or the challenge setting. And that then doesn't allow us to push our thinking, to stretch us and to um, be actually true to what should happen. And I came from healthcare. So ha talking about how many falls should be acceptable in a day or how many, you know, preventable errors, like, no, zero <laughs> should be the, you know, the, the answer. And so how do we change our mindset from what we know we can achieve to really what is what is needed? Because, and if we go back to this concept of the attitude towards learning, it's what you learn from the lessons of not reaching your targets that make you smarter. However, what this also um, means is we need to have a culture that welcomes and embraces failure and mistakes and is not punitive and where leaders are and everyone is seeing um, us not reaching the goal as not a bad thing, but actually as our opportunity for learning. So these have to go hand in hand. So the second part of a leader's purpose is to provide support. And I like to say, this is where we start to talk about the, the ands. It's providing that direction and that challenge, that challenging target, and we have to provide support to our people. If we don't do both, then we're really just like throwing them out into a super challenge, like that's, that's disrespectful to our people. We need to be there to help them learn how to problem solve, to remove barriers, to support along the way. And it's this fine line of how do you balance both pushing people into something that might feel uncomfortable, yet providing that support. And sometimes you may have to provide more support and less challenge, and other times it's more challenge and less support. But how do we do and challenge and support? So leaders own create the creation of the structures and processes for learning. So we can't help other, we can't make other people learn or make them improve, but we can allow them the opportunities and the um, enable them to have 
situations that allow them to learn. So how do we create space that gives people opportunity to learn where we're not seeing everything as a crisis that has to be fixed now, where we're rushing in and giving answers, but allow people some time and space for thinking and for some failure along the way as well. Because it's that process of learning that is really important. There is, um, actually there are two stories I wanna share right now. Uh, first is about how uh, when Mr. Yoshino joined, joined Toyota, there was, uh, he was 22 years old and he was put out in the Gemba. The Gemba is the word for the place where the work is done. He had, he was gonna be in the back office doing, you know, uh, you know, desk work, but he was put in the front line of the, the, of the car manufacturer and he was assigned to the paint shop. And his job was to pour paint and solvent into a big vat that then they would spray the paint, the cars coming down the line. And one day, and he even admitted it got kind of boring. One day he, he, met, he, he made a mistake and the, what, the, one of the shop floor managers came running up saying the paint wasn't sticking to the cars. Over a hundred cars were gonna have to be repainted. And he was thinking, uh oh, you know, this, is, this, is, this is not good. And instead of yelling at him, the managers came over and said, you know, show us what you did. And he did, he showed, he showed them and it became very clear that the, the can of the paint and the solvent looked very similar. Not only did they not blame him for the mistake, they thanked him. They said, thank you for making this mistake. Uh, you should highlighted to us that, you know, we have not set up the working conditions for you to be successful. You know, they needed to better label the, the, the paint containers so that someone new in the environment could not make that mistake as well. And so this ties back to, we have to create these opportunities in a culture where it's okay to make mistakes and that, that leaders own, own that condition. And then we also teach them the process of learning. So another example is when Mr. Yoshino fast forward 10 more years in his career, he was asked to prepare a report. He was now in the Tokyo office and he knew he should go out to talk to the actual companies to get firsthand information, but he felt pressed for time. And so instead just went to the library and looked at some books and created his report. And when he started to present his findings to the senior leader of the Tokyo office and his direct reports, the manager, the leader said, how did you get your information? And he said, oh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry. I know I should have talked to the, the companies, but I was so pressed for time. I just went to the library and the, and the leader said, stop. Nope, you need to go back and talk. You know, I'm gonna give you one more week. I want you to talk to these companies. And ultimately Mr. Yoshino re found out that the boss did not care about the information he found he wanted to teach him how to do completeness of thinking. And at Toyota, that meant going to Gemba, going to the actual place to validate, uh, to get facts, not just data. So facts are gathered from talking to people, going to see what's actually happening, and then creating his report that way, not just collecting it from books that maybe had been written a year or two before. And so again, that's that process of learning. How do we help teach people um, how to learn and how to do things more deeply um, and completely. And oh, sorry, I had my my uh, my slide switched around. So this is this is this this is the slide of the quote when Mr. Yoshino is talking about that paint story about we all make mistakes. So how do we create an environment that is, doesn't blame people immediately for making mistakes, but really um, sees it as a learning opportunity and people take responsibility for helping prevent mistakes um, to happen again in the future. And how um, another way to, to provide support is how do we make the invisible visible? So you hear so much about how do we, how do we write reports? How do we make drawings? How do we show red versus green, um, like you know, on track versus off track? Um, how do we take things that we, that are just thoughts in our head and make it visible for everyone to see? Um, and so the more we can make things explicit and to make it easy to see at a glance, are we on track or off track, if it's normal or abnormal, that is how we're going to be able to collaborate and problem solve more effectively. And then the third, third component is a leader's purpose is developing yourself. And this is around, I've, I found that this is the biggest challenge for people around this and. We, um, because often we're like, we either need to see ourselves as the expert or the coach. We like need to be, we we're getting this habit of telling people our ideas, sometimes with the intention of helping, 
but not realizing that now when we're developing other people, we need to show up and be more asking. So how do we do both and how do we balance that? And so we, this challenges us when we start to move into more of a people development role of how do we navigate these continuums and how do we not show up as um, this or that, but how do we know how to navigate so it's this and that. So a few of the continuums that I've talked about, this advocacy inquiry continuum, which is not that telling is bad and that asking is only good, but that we have been, uh, as we become adults, we, we err on the side of so much telling and showing up, having the answers of being those experts. And if we can balance, rebalance this continuum and start asking some better and more effective questions, this is how we really engage more people and draw out more thinking. Also, when we show up telling people our ideas, the unintended consequence is that we end up owning all of the problem solving. So not only are we the bottleneck, but we are overwhelmed by all the problems that we have responsibility for. So how do we keep more problem solving responsibility um, at the right level? And that's by providing the support through asking. And certainly, there's times when people are stuck and you need to show them the way, but we err too much on the side of this scale of that people need our answer and need us to tell them what, um, what to do, how to do it, and what our great idea is. And that can be very disengaging as well. And again, this is how do we, how do we own our expertise? So most of you have some expertise that you have been trained in or developed in, uh, but when we show up as the expert problem solver, we then take over that responsibility for the problem solving as well. So these two continuums are very tightly connected. Having someone be an expert is really, really helpful for a, a deep technical situation. You know, I, <laughs> my computer is broken, like the back end of my website. I do not want to learn how all the, I mean, I've gotten pretty good at doing like my website management, but like, I don't know the deep backend code. I need someone who has been trained in that, is expertise, and I grant problem solving ownership to that person. However, again, especially when we're in these roles as leaders or as coaches, how do we out show up asking more questions and not, and our expertise is setting that structure for the learning and teaching the processes, but not taking over um, the actual problem solving thinking. And that was the journey that I needed to go on to when I first started in a performance improvement role. And I thought this was a very profound quote from Mr. Yoshino too. It's, it's only by being able to explore ideas and failing and stumbling and struggling a little bit that we learn how to move towards more, you know, getting, get first getting to that right answer, but we get better at problem solving and more effective. And Looking at our own personal improvement, I consider this um, the same plan, do, check, act, or plan, do, study, um, adjust cycle. But I actually like to start with study. And I'm, I'm sort of advocating now for a movement of study, adjust, plan, do, because we have to start with understanding our current situation before we start jumping to creating plans. So if we start with studying, this will help us from jumping to um, starting with solutions and then working backwards. So we can apply the same thinking to ourselves. And if we think about leading and living with intention, so creating some self-awareness of what are your current habits and what happens as a result? Are they actually connected? Are they uh, in alignment with who you wanna be and the outcome and impact you wanna have? So then adjust, what's your new goal? Who do you wanna be? What does better look like? What experiments are you going to try on yourself? What are you gonna practice? doing it and then reflecting again. And so if we can do these micro study adjust plan do cycles every day, that's how we are gonna improve. And then we can take this forward and help the others that we're working with as well. And I advocate with starting with studying because reflection, which is the study component is the beginning and not the end of learning. And so I already shared with you this, this Japanese proverb. It's, it's one of my favorites, as I said, um, and we have to persevere and it's okay for us to be imperfect, but we have to keep getting up and learning from um, our mistakes and what um, and learning along the way and how do we help others do that as well. Uh, so another quick practicing Hansei section. What's one takeaway or reflection you have um, from this, this component? And then I'm gonna share with you three, three practices that I found invaluable 
to um, help become a more intentional leader. All right, great. Keep going in there, great, great. Thank you, everyone. All right, so three practices that I um, have learned for myself and I, I teach almost in any, any session I do to become a more effective people-centered leader. The first is to pay attention to the quality of your questions. I think the number one skill or one of the top skills, but certainly the most, the easiest shift that we can make is to shift our question asking because we, this is the telling versus asking continuum. We often think we're asking, but we're actually telling. And so this funny looking animal is a wolf disguised as a sheep. It is really the same thing. We often, when we ask prompting or leading questions, things that can be asked with it, answered with a yes or a no, or really is an idea with a question mark on the side. Have you thought about trying my great idea? You are not really asking a genuine open question to help support someone else's thinking. You're advocating or proposing your own idea. So pay attention to this and reframe your question as a genuine what or how question. So think about what you were trying to suggest and then say like, not what, what about trying my great idea, but like um, what next steps could you try? Who have you talked to? What, what have you done so far? What departments might have some information about this? So really as a question that you do not have the answer to. These are the true um, coaching questions rather than our fake questions when we think we're asking a question, but we're really not. Um, also then listen openly. Uh, Jamie, you'll be familiar with these drawings. They're from my friend and coaching partner, Karen, about how we have to listen with our, not just our ears, but see with our eyes, listen with an, uh, without, with an open mind. So without making assumptions about people and then with an, with an open heart as well, um, that really connecting with people. And this gets back to our intention too. Like, are you there because you need to be the one who's right? Or are you the, in like needing to advocate for your opinion? Or are you there to help someone else and showing up however is gonna be most effective for them? And then the third, which is taking an intention pause. So really connecting with who do you wanna be in that moment even, and how you're gonna align your actions. Sometimes you are the leader that needs to set the direction or you're the parent at the time that needs to like be very clear on these are the expectations. These are the times where you need to be telling, but there are other times where you need to be more um, thoughtful <laughs> and asking more questions and um, listening more, more patiently. So this helps us align with who we want to be in that moment. So I, I really, and this can be 10 seconds between transitions between Zoom meetings or walking into another room. This has been really an uh, accelerator for me personally and for others as well. So I want to go back to these leadership continuums that it's not about asking or telling, it's knowing when to ask um, and when to tell. It's not about being a content expert or a coach to help someone move forward. It's knowing about when someone needs your knowledge and when they're better served by creating their own. And actually when we ask questions, we can then understand where people are on that scale. It's not just providing a challenge or supporting them. It's understanding when and how to both challenge and to support them to move forward. And it's not just about focusing on business outcomes only or people development only. It's how do you do both at the same time? So how can we shift our thinking from or to and and learn to navigate that continuum? And to remind ourselves that learning is never perfect and it's never complete and that's okay in our imperfection with that. So as we wrap up today and move into some uh, questions, I want you to set your intention coming out of today that what is one thing that you're gonna practice with intention to improve as a leader or a coach, as it's someone who's helping other people develop and to put that into the chat as well. What's the one thing that you're really gonna take away from today that you are gonna practice? Yeah, questions, questions, great. Pay attention to the quality of your questions. Quality questions, great. Well, uh, I'm glad that everyone's saying the questions because I have something special to announce for you here that I am uh, just announcing this morning. Actually, in 15 minutes, a message will be going out to my whole list um, about this new workshop that I'm leading three weeks from today, um, almost three weeks exactly from today, focusing on 
asking more effective questions and listening. It's titled Breaking the Telling Habit, How to Use Powerful Questions to Unlock Innovation and Amplify Engagement. And for one week, I have a 20% off um, coupon or you know, code that you can use to register. So the easiest way to get the link is just to go to my website at kbjanderson.com uh, forward slash academy. It has links to that workshop um, where you can learn more um, details when you click the link that's on this page, as well as um, some other links for the work, the book, the new workbook that I have put out too as an electronic um, version, and then some other workshops that I've led recently that are for self-paced learning. Um, and most importantly, I really would love to connect with each and every one of you. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, I, I'm genuinely someone who likes to help and connect with people around the world. And however I can show up to be helpful to you, to continue your learning journey, um, is really meaningful to me and allows me to fulfill my purpose and my intention in life. So I'd love for you to join me in the, um, in the workshop um, or some other thing in the future as well. So I will pause there and then we can have a, some discussion until the top of the hour. So does anyone have any questions for Katie? I think we're, we're yeah. a group of about 40. I, I, I think you can go ahead and just, yes. um, just, just raise your hand or, or call out or yeah, or just works for you or, or comments. Yeah, I'd love to hear anything, just reflections, questions, what you what this made you think of, anything. Katie, I have a question. Yeah, go for it, Mark. So what resources do you have to improve the quality of our questions? I have, um, well, there's, I've written a few blog posts. So if you go on my website and, and Google questions, I have some downloads and some articles that really go deeper. Of course, then join me in the workshop because there's going to be an hour of the actual practice as well. And so sometimes you really need that, that opportunity to practice and get feedback. So this is why it's a live workshop um, and it will include um, an hour of practicing, asking questions, giving feedback, listening, and uh, hopefully helping you solve a problem as well. But I do have other uh, resources on my website as well, if you want to go there and just uh, look in the search bar. Thanks. And I have linked Katie's website in the chat for those who are looking for it. There is no silly question either, so. Uh, AD, I have one. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, so like, how do you recognize that you're telling rather than asking like soon enough or, or how do you, when you have an interaction with somebody think about, did I, did I do what I intended to do? So then like, you know, you don't just repeat what you always have done when you're trying to change yourself kind of. Yeah. Um, so a few things on that, you know, first is I, I, I do advocate for telling people, you know, that you're working with even that you're working on asking better and more effective questions, because this also shows humility as well. And you're teaching them to do the same thing with the people that they work with. And uh, I then suggest you follow up at the end and say, what was a helpful question that I asked today? And you get feedback from them. Um, and it also starts to, um, you can, it can spark another dialogue. I actually use this with a physician leader. I was, well, I use this often, but I remember in particular a physician leader I was working with, he had, he genuinely cared about his people and wanted to help support them, but he had been so trained as an expert, you know, expert problem solver. He would go into the, go do, they were at their, their um, visibility wall in their unit. And he was there to ask questions as a, you know, mid-level leader and, he even asked this to the supervisor, what was a helpful question I asked today? And the supervisor said, you didn't really ask any questions today. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so that was a very powerful feedback for him. Like, oh, okay. Um, another thing you can do is have someone write down what you say or even record yourself and go back and listen to it and, and pay attention to how many, just get some feedback for yourself. How many open-ended questions did you ask versus how many leading or prompting questions did you ask as well? And that can be a really powerful um, feedback of evidence because often we think we're asking more questions. 
And I even, I have been working on this for, for years for myself. I've gotten way, way, way better, but I like leading questions come out of my mouth all the time. So as I'm starting to like, if I hear myself at starting to even say a leading question or, you know, or a prompting question, and it's not some, you know, in that moment, I'm actually wanting to genuinely hear what the other person's saying rather than introducing my ideas. I'll, I'll literally pause mid, you know, mid phrase and rephrase it. So feel, do that and just say, oh, actually, I want to you know, rephrase that. Here's a, here's a better question for you. So it's, um, those are a few tips that I have. Do you have a link to your workshop that you could post in the chat? Yeah, um, I'll just find the direct link while we're talking. Okay. Uh, you know, one moment. Uh, Julian I, has her hand up, it looks like. Yeah, I have a question. Going back to this idea of setting the direction, um, when you're at a table full of people who are focused so intensely on um, achievable, um, and how do you how do you move the needle when the room just only wants to focus on what we can do versus what's actually needed? What do you have? Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, actually, let me. <laughs> Uh, I just realized that the workshop is still set as a draft, and so you will not be able to actually see the workshop. So let me just hit publish. Ta da! <laughs> now I'll have something to share with you that will be helpful. Uh, can you repeat the question now that I've hit that one thing? And uh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So I'm thinking about the times when we're sitting around a table that is full of people who are focused on. Um, what is achievable and kind of trying to move that needle away from ach achievable more toward what is needed. If you have some ideas about that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm pausing. So this is something else I do often. Like sometimes we see pauses as like someone doesn't have, like, it's okay not to have the answer. Like you asked a really good question. And so I, <laughs> I need to think for a moment. Um, how I've handled that in the past is like is is really to to break it down to sort of ultimately what is the what is truly what's needed here. Maybe we don't think we can get there this year, but then like let's let's clearly set out like what's the right thing, what is what's the that long term challenge, and then if we need to break it down into what do we think are actually like more achievable but challenging steps to get there, that can be helpful for people because sometimes it's like you know the gap is so big that then you're like oh it's so overwhelming. But at the end of the day, you can't have like, let's set that challenge to what's needed. And then let's talk about what are, what, what's the, the how are we going to get there? Um, so I found that that can be helpful as well. I don't know if that totally answered your question, but that would, that would be uh, one thing that I would do. Anyone else? What advice would you give um, someone just starting out with a brand new team um, that you've been working with a lot of um, individuals who um, are kind of stuck in their ways and have a, have a trouble uh, adopting a new way or a new process about building um, or going about building their projects? Yeah, you know, the, um, the very first thing I've, you know, there's that, that's a, that, that's a big, that's a big question, but I, to, to at least get some shared first work on team relationships. And so getting to know each other, this, you know, we need to, especially in a work environment, we tend to just sort of jump into the work side, the problem, the out, the business outcome that we need to achieve. Um, without necessarily understanding who each other are. So how can we do some of that team building uh, at first and then work on getting sort of at least some shared alignment and agreement on sort of what is our purpose as a team? What are the you know, things that we need to achieve together? And so that there is, there is some um, shared understanding together. We can all be moving, maybe not, in one, it's not gonna take one, one session or one meeting, but working both on creating connection with people 
and then creating alignment on where do we need to go or what's our goal. And then we can start working together to do the problem solving um, would be where I would um, get started. And again, anchoring on like, what's the value to the customer? Or what's the, thing, like, you know, at, at children, a children's hospital, you know, you had the silos of the doctors and the nurses and the administrative staff and everyone gets so focused on their, their one area and everyone's there with a genuine heart. They really care, you know, <laughs> but if we brought it back to what does the patient need, the patient and the family and kept the focus on that, that helped break down the silos as well. So, yeah. So I'd say for who, like, what do your customers need and getting some like excitement around that. And then that can, um, that can help. Oh, I was going to send you the link to the, ah, uh, I don't, know why my whole product thing let me uh, I don't know why all right hopefully this my, my don't know why it's still here we go now I can say view is visitor here um here's the link to the there you go and then if you use that discount code, that will help you as well for the workshop. Thank you. That has problem solving in the back end right, <laughs> right then. Why is this not published? It should have been. Uh, what was so the thank discount you. code again? Oh, the discount code uh, was in my slide. Here, let me get that for, ah, let me get that for you as well. It was early bird Q20. Yep, yeah, I'll just, I'll pop that in the chat as well. And if you use it, yeah. Uh, there you go. Early bird Q20. There we go. There and you so go. We have some some last minute advice for so so many of us are are individual contributors, and 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 really how do we how do we start to to I guess be an ambassador for that mindset of of continual continual learning with, within the organization and and really really asking those questions. Are we focusing on on what we think we can accomplish or what we actually need to accomplish, right? And, and how do you get that mindset, you know, as an individual contributor to, to start to flow through it through an organization? How can we be ambassadors for that at, at, at that level? Yeah, you know, I think um, just what you said, Jamie, is how do you start asking I know it can feel risky and I, you know, I've been mainly in independent contributor roles or managing a team of people who are those you know, internal coaches and consultants in organization. But part of our role um, is to ask those questions you know, and, and you have to do it in a place where you feel safe, um, yet part, you're helping model the way for the organization and for the leaders to learn another way. You're, you're, so starting to ask those questions, well, what, what do our customers need? Um, you know, it, you know, it, it just even starting to ask more questions to help people think, um, or like what, what could be a slightly more challenging, um, target for us, even if we can't, if we can't meet it. I think sometimes what's challenging is our internal structures or like, you know, the HR systems, like our compensation is tied to hitting certain targets. So people may, you know, it reinforces people not wanting to set challenging targets. They're probably not going to meet. And that's a whole nother, um, a whole nother topic. But I say, just keep asking more questions in a, in a way that is not confrontational or judgmental, but is a genuine start, you know, connected with, with the purpose and even labeling what you're doing. Like, um, I, I want to ask some questions to help advance our thinking on this and like think more outside the box or whatever you want to say um, to, to help to help challenge us. I'm, I'm going to be provocative and even label label it out there so that people like, you know, like it, and the more we can be make the invisible visible. It also teaches people why we're doing something. So uh, I have found that invaluable. Just <laughs> label what you're doing all the time it, when you're facilitating, say, oh, I'm counting to 10 in my head because, you know, I want to give you space for thinking. And then people know why there's this awkward silence and they're like, oh, I should do that too. So label what you're doing and, um, right. yeah, and have the courage and, and come join me on some more learning experiences. So. <laughs> Thank you all so much for um, a great start to my morning um, and for the questions and being there and um, please reach out and connect. And thank you, Jamie, for the invitation yep. to be here thank today. You. 
Thank you, right. Katie, for joining us. And thanks to everyone else who could who could join us this morning. I appreciate all of you. Um, Katie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And have a great rest of your week, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.